On farm post harvest coffee processing is essential for ensuring high cup quality and constitutes a chain of interlinked phases. Coffee fermentation is increasingly turning out to be a key determinant for extracting more flavor and quality from the coffee bean. To talk on this important aspect of the coffee value chain, we have with us Mr. Marcelo Pereira Magna. Mr. Marcelo Pereira is a coffee consultant based in Oakland, California. He is an experienced coffee cupper, judge, quality advisor, and buyer of Arabica and Robusta coffees. He has worked on several international projects with the Coffee Quality Institute, TechnoServe, Windrock International, and USAID in different countries around East Africa, Asia, and South America. Currently, he is a quality specialist and private consultant focused on using quali coffee quality as a means of improving the livelihood of smallholder coffee farmers around the world. I welcome Mr. Marcelo Pereira to present his paper on good harvest practices, different post-harvest fermentation processes, and best post-fermentation drying. Over to you, Mr. Marcelo. Hello. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with, with you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor and a privilege to be in front of you. Unfortunately, I, I have only been here for uh, just a few days, and I have had the opportunity to talk just a few with just a few of you. And I don't know much about the coffee status or quality. I haven't been to a farm. So I am, in my presentation, I'm going to assume many things that probably you're going to be considered wrong. We can discuss them later. Also, uh, during the presentation, I'm going to probably talk a little um, uh, about things that are going to be probably not very um, uh, uh, you're not going to like that much, but it's necessary. I consider them necessary. I'm coming from far away, and uh, I chose the presentation in a, as a way of how can I... These people are coffee growers. They know about growing coffee. They know all about agriculture. How can I give them something that they don't have? So I, I created this presentation to, to, as a way of, if, I, if it were me, what I would want it to somebody talk to me, how I, how I would like to be talked to, or how, what are the things that I would need to know. So that's, that's the way I created this. So if, if, uh, if there is something wrong or, or something that you don't consider that is appropriate, I'm I changed the title a little bit uh, because I, I think that before we start running, we need to start walking. Uh, processing is like a recipe that you do at home to cook. But uh, before you, you do the cooking, you need to know everything about the kitchen. I have a friend that he went to a uh, chef school, and he left because the first two years, he only washed dishes. And it's because you, when you go to that school, you need to know everything about the kitchen before they allow you to touch something else. And that's more or less what I'm trying to do here. I want to give you an introduction of what I think the problem is, because based on what I have heard and what I have, the knowledge that I know that you are experiencing now is, uh, you are tired of the commodity market for coffee. You would like it to be better. You would like to decommodize your industry. You would like to have access to better markets. So that's more or less what I'm trying to tell you. In a few words, how can you do that? And what are you doing wrong and that you cannot achieve that goal so far? OK? So the first thing is uh, there are many myths. There are many things that we heard and, and we repeat all the time. Uh, people talk, ah, the coffee is the, is the most traded commodity in the world. Coffee is the most, drink, uh, the, 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 the most popular drink in the world, and that's not true. Based on, on and the, the, the MIT Observatory Economic Complexity, coffee is 
98th in terms of, is in terms of uh, importance. And it's just in terms of all the, the commodities, agricultural commodities, it's also not very important either. So when people come to you, that many people will, even buyers, they will come and tell you, no, the coffee is the most important commodity in the world. It's not. Another important thing is that we don't need coffee to live. Co coffee is, is just a, a pleasure that we have. So uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about, uh, about sustainability, when we talk about uh, biodiversity, when we talk about uh, uh, industrial farming, we need to consider that. Is coffee that important? That it, it, it's worth like destroying our environment to do it? Like many, many Brazilian farmers are doing it. So what I, I would like you to, t the first thing that I would like to tell you is that in many places that I go, like I have been like this, uh, uh, many farmers, they try to copy Brazil. They want to be like Brazil. We want to sell a lot of coffee and we want to make a lot of money uh, selling commodity. I know that you're, you're uh, um, uh, business people and you have many business, businesses going and, and probably coffee is not a priority. And you would like only to put it on wheels and, and to, give it, to give you some profit. Uh, usually that's not the way that is working right now and I'm going to show you why. So the first thing that we need to talk is about the past. Our, our, our history or coffee started to matter and things started to change in the 1940s. What happened in the 1940s? We were coming, uh, the, the war was starting and uh, something that the war, an effect that the war has and it has always had it, is that once a war starts, the coffee consumption goes really high. Troops, they can stop eating but they cannot stop drinking coffee. There is the Second World War, uh, many, many, um, uh, uh, the, was that coffee cup that they had in the morning before going to, to, to the front, to the war. Uh, so during that time in the 1940s that, that uh, uh, the world needed so much coffee, the U.S. decided to create what is called the International, sorry, the Inter-American Coffee Agreement. That is, will be the, the first one. That it cre it's called I I A ICA in 1940s. That was a unilateral treaty that had with, uh, the U.S. with producing countries. In that treaty, uh, the U.S. established quotas for each member. So the only, any of the members, the only thing that they need to focus on was to produce enough coffee to send and they will get paid. That was it. They didn't need to know anything about quality. They didn't need to know anything about the type of processing. They just needed to send that amount of coffee every year, and that would be it, and they would get their money. So the, the treaty uh, in 1960, it, it was very successful during that time. Uh, during the war, we have had the most consumption in the US and in the world that we have ever had. Uh, people had, were drinking a lot of coffee because of, of the, the war. But although they were consuming more coffee, coffee is more popular today. And uh, people ask me, why then uh, uh, coffee is not sold the same way or consumed the same way as it was back then? And the reason is that back then, we used to drink coffee alone. The, the troops were only drinking water and coffee. But now, we're mixing coffee with so many things that at the end, you are only in a cup of coffee that you get in a coffee shop, you have one finger of, of coffee and the rest is just milk or whatever, what, anything else. So although coffee is more popular than ever, we're not drinking enough. Culture is keeping consumers to drink more of it. They put alcohol drinks, they put milk, the oat, oat 
uh, oat milk, uh, uh, well, all these variants of milk that there are, that are now. And uh, that's the most popular drink. If you ask at Starbucks, at Starbucks, they said that 90% of all their drinks have milk in it. So it's, it's Starbucks is not selling coffee. They say that they are a coffee shop, but they're a milk shop. They're selling more. It's, it's milk flavored with coffee. And that's something that we, as producers, we can also have an impact on, on changing that, how people consume and how people appreciate coffee. Uh, in, in, in the 19... Uh, 63, the, the coffee agreement was changed. It was reissued with a different name. In this time, the, it was released with the name International Coffee Agreement. In this time, no, it was not just the US with producing countries. It was all consuming countries with all producing countries. So it was an agreement that everyone all countries in the world were going to buy from producing countries with quotas. During that time, the ICO, that probably you have heard about, about them, uh, right now they only do data analysis and they release uh, uh, data. Uh, uh, and also you as exporters probably you send some information to them in order for them to keep track of how coffee and volumes and all of that is going on. But back then they had a, a main role in the international coffee agreements. They were the ones that setting the quotas for each country. They were setting prices, they were setting quotas, and this was a, an incredible success. It was really good for farmers' pockets, but it was really bad for farmers' minds. What happened is that during that time, we, as producers, we were selling all our coffee, but we get dormant. We didn't do much about it. We didn't learn anything. We were just producing and filling quotas and sending and shipping all over and getting money that it was good. But by, there, in the consuming countries, there were people that they were consuming these coffees and they were analyzing them. They were tasting the coffees. They were diving into oceans of, of commodity coffee, tasted, tasting them all and finding difference among them. And they created markets for this type of coffee, markets for that type of coffee. So they created an entire new, new industry. In 1978, the name Specialty Coffee was launched. 1978, that was even before you know, it, it, everything fell apart, because the, the International Coffee Agreement fell apart in 1989. So all these people, they got a huge advantage over us as producers. They knew about how coffee should taste like. They knew about how high quality coffee, the difference between high quality coffee and bad coffee. They knew how to, to what countries were better or what countries had different profiles and there are other countries that had a different profiles. In the meantime, we were only shipping. So they got ahead in, the times of, in, in terms of the, the sensing, the, 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 the flavor sensing and the, the, the profile developing and also uh, the quality analysis. And these people are our customers. Back then, they didn't have a choice. They needed to buy whatever we sold. So what happened with us as a producer? We were selling the worst that we could produce because it was faster and it was cheaper. The cheaper it was, it was getting, the more money it was going to get into our pockets. So we created the commodity market. We, producers, created the commodity market. We were selling coffee that was uh, under optimal to the global market. It was a coffee that was suboptimal. It's the only industry that I, that I know that the main product is suboptimal. And that is something that now we carry. This ended, but we carry it as a, this is our legacy, and now it's a nightmare because we need to fight, it, fight against it. So the International Coffee Agreement was a, a huge, huge, huge success. It ended in 1989 because the US, they were tired about the quality. They, they said, look, we need to end this because the coffee quality is getting so low that we cannot handle this anymore. We're not going to accept this anymore. And Brazil also wanted to end it because they knew that without the quota system, they were going to unleash their power as, a, as a, their supremacy in coffee production. 
Brazil right now is the largest producer of, of specialty coffee and also the largest producers of coffee quality. And this is something that you cannot forget because this is your now, back then, in when the International Coffee Agreement was in place, Brazil was our ally. Brazil was our, 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 we were doing things together. We can share information because we were, their quotas were not our quotas and we were not interfered with each other. We were partners in the same process. But then in 1989, when the, the coffee, International Coffee Agreement ended, all these, 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 these uh, partners now became competitors. We ended up with uh, big competitors. We have Brazil, that is the largest producer in the world. So if you try, if you as an Indian farmer, you try to compete with, with uh, Brazil in terms of volume, you already lost. If you're trying to compete in terms of volume and price, you're already in, in a losing game. So how can you compete with, with, with Brazil? So that's something that happened in, in 1989. In 1989, it was a, a cold shower for all, all uh, uh, coffee farmers around the world. I was recently in Tanzania and I, and I met a, a farmer that he's 86 years old. He's uh, one of the oldest people that are still active that I, that I know. And we were talking about these times. And he was always, he was telling me how good these times were. How good were the times where we didn't care about. If that would have continued, I wouldn't have a job right now. So for me, uh, I see it, uh, it was good for the farmers, but it's also, it spoiled them because it, it was a distorted market. It was a market that, it was a reality that it was fake. We were living in a fake reality. And uh, so what happened in 1989 is that it ended abruptly and the coffee price went half. It was, uh, I think it was uh, uh, 170 when it ended and it was then like 60 cents per pound. And it stayed that way. And farmers around the world in 1989, I'm, I'm, I, was a, I was ending my school back then, uh, but I know that based on what I have talked to them, um, uh, they, they didn't know what to do. So the, the, the countries that keep the lead in terms of what to do, they said, Colombia is one of them, they said, what do we do to compete? If we, we cannot compete with volume, uh, 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 Brazil is gonna completely smash us. Uh, so we need to, to create a strategy based on quality. So they created in the 1990s, Colombia comes with a plan of a, of a image country of coffee. And they create this and they start doing a lot of publicity in a, a US media. They invested, they invested a billion dollars because they knew, although they were not making any money with, the, with the, the coffee, they needed to find a way for, for consumers to start buying the, the quality coffee that they were, pay, they were producing, that it was a, a little bit more expensive. They succeed at a certain point. If you go to the, to, the, the, in, uh, to the market right now and you see the coffees that are in the market, you will see that you have Colombian miles, you have uh, 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 Brazilian miles, and in, in other miles. So Colombia was able to reach a spot in the, in the Tocomode in the market a little bit higher than the rest of, of, of countries uh, that they, they have even today. So what we can do, we, we need to do something like Colombia did, because, also, because otherwise we will be trying to imagine something like this, like we are trying to compete with McDonald's making burgers. I can make a very good burger at home, but McDonald's is always gonna be better selling them than me. So I need to find a way that, that the customer will buy my burger and not theirs. So this is what we're trying to do with coffee. We need to create something that makes us unique, something that makes us valuable some, for the consumer. And so far, the, 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 the Brazilians, they have unleashed this, this is power so, so much that they are the largest producer of specialty coffee. So even if you go for, for specialty, 
for the specialty route, your coffee needs to be really good. Not average good. It needs to be really good in order to compete. And that's what Kenya does. That's what Ethiopia does. Guatemala is doing it. Colombia is doing it. In order to be competitive in, in the market with quality coffee, you need to be above 84 points right now. And producing 84 points at, based on the SCA scale is not easy. It's not easy. Remember, we are used to produce a suboptimal product. So going from that, to producing a suboptimal product, to a specialty grade, we need to remove all sensory defects, all visual defects, and create something that is good enough to compete with the rest. I don't want to uh, make you afraid or anything, because this is possible. This is something that I'm, 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 I, I actually have done it. My previous job, I was in Myanmar. I was working for Windrock International. And uh, we were working with smallholder farmers back then. And the idea it was to, they have very little coffee. And Myanmar has always had coffee, but no one knows about it, because it has always been very expensive to produce and very bad. And there is no market for bad and expensive. There is market for bad and cheap or good and expensive. So what we try to do over there is to change their coffee from bad and expensive to good and expensive. So we organize the farmers, we train the farmers, we introduce the farmers to new markets, and then we, the, the, the new markets appreciate the flavor, and they are still doing a, a business till today. You can find those coffees in, in Europe, in the US, and they are doing good, uh, although the, the, the coup that they had recently wasn't, wasn't great for that. But that's a, that's a completely different topic. So what comes next? So this is the consumption, uh, what, what I just told you during the 40s. The gallons per capita of coffee in the US just spike. And you see that goes down, 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 down. And uh, although the coffee is very, very popular, is not consume enough. People consume it very in a tiny ways. Very just drops of coffee in an ocean of milk. And this is also something that has changed. This is what you have here is what people used to drink in the 1940s. The coffee inside you put water and then the water start boiling and the water from the bottom goes to the top and then goes through the coffee and then goes again with the coffee and then goes back down, creating like the most unbelievable over extraction, like the most bitter coffee that there is. It's, a, it's, it's not a way to pro, pro, uh, of making coffee, it's a way to destroying the coffee. And that was, that was the most popular way of producing coffee till 1972. That machine, little machine, the Mr. Coffee, was revolutionary. It has the same age as I, I it was born the same time as I, as I was. And it changed the way people consume coffee at, at home. So for the first time in history, a, a US or people at home could have a, a good coffee, a coffee that was correctly brewed. So what you see is that if we sell coffee to these people, from the past, we don't need to care about quality. They're going to destroy it anyways. But if we sell coffee to the new people, this is just, I'm telling you, this is 1972, and things have changed even more from that. We are not going to be able to, to, to fool them. People at home, they know. And, and also, uh, the US is one of the largest consumers of wash coffee. And these people, they, they, are, they have all the skills in the world in order to, to guess in between good coffees, bad coffees. So uh, we're not dealing with the people that consume this type of drink anymore. We're drinking with, with people that, that actually know about quality. There is still a lot to improve in terms of the market, but it's a de demanding market. And uh, when you compare the, the American market, that they buy, I think, uh, close to 50% of the coffee that they consume is a uh, specialty grade with other markets like in the Middle East that they only buy like really bad coffee because they mix, they mix a lot of spices into it, like the Turkish coffee. 
Uh, here in India, also the quality of the, what people consume is very low. Uh, in Latin America, where I come from, is a, I remember I used to work with a, a quality, uh, uh, in a quality lab in Brazil, and the worst coffees that there is were was, was being sold to Argentina. Argentina was buying coffee that was so, so bad that we call it the Argentinian grade. And this, you know, is how you recognize the trends among countries, because you know more or less what they're buying. And Europeans and Americans, they buy kind of a so-so coffee. It needs to be clean. It needs to be kind of good, but it doesn't need to be perfect. But if you go to the, to the north, you have Norway that they drink, like they are the best drinkers of coffee in the world. They buy only the, the coffees that have been uh, picked by hand, and, and they know it. You know, they, if, you go, uh, if you go to Norway and you go to a coffee shop, you will see that these people, they will have amazing coffees. Coffees that, I, that, I, that, that you probably, they have coffee from India that you have never tried, that you have never even thought that they exist. In Ethiopia, I live in Ethiopia for three years, and in order to have some of the coffees, I needed to try them in Europe because they were not available locally. And if you go to the farmer, the farmer, they, they were already sold. So even people locally, they didn't have access to all of this. So this is a type of market, a very demanding market that, that we are, we are uh, dealing with. And the problem is not the consumer. The problem is the exporters, the roasters, and the people that buy the coffee. These people know what they're doing, or already, or, 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 or uh, uh, at least they have hired somebody that knows about it. So if you want to compete, you need to know more, more about coffee than them. And we're going to talk about that next. So differentiation. This is a, 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 a very important topic. Something that I see that, that has been historically uh, uh, common is that uh, in colonies, when, when the, the, the British retreat, also that was the reason the International Coffee, Coffee Agreement happened, is that there was a, a resentment, or, or at least European countries, they felt this resentment from former colonies. They thought that these, these people that were in the in the, in the colonies, uh, they have some resentment against them, and they will join forces with the communists, that it was the Russian bloc. So they didn't want this to happen, and that's why the, the International Coffee Agreement was reissued. Another of the reasons. We, uh, uh, the Europe or the West, or they, they were afraid of these um, emerging countries, uh, emerging free countries, will join forces with the communists. That was in the middle of the Cold War, so we, could, uh, we, we should uh, also place us in history, in the time in, in history. And, uh, and also another disadvantage that you have is that most of, I saw that in, I have seen it in Uganda, I have seen it in Kenya, I have seen it in Myanmar, and now I've seen it here, is that once you, you have soft re retreats and hard retreats. Uh, an example of a, uh, of a way that the Europeans retrieved hardly was, for example, uh, Zimbabwe, that they left and uh, the coffee industry just disappeared when they left. Some other countries, uh, Europeans or British, they were allowed to keep their, their processions and continue with doing their businesses, like in the case of Tanzania or Kenya. I don't know exactly how it was here in, in, in India, but what, what I know is that these properties or these farms at the end end up in Indian hands. It could be by auctions, it could be by, by uh, purchases. And now these farmers, uh, former uh, farms, coffee farms, ended up in Indian hands. But the problem is that they, once the people that knew the market back then, the people that knew how to sell the coffee, the people that knew everything about coffee, they were gone. You just received something that it doesn't belong to your culture. You receive something that you don't know anything about. You know that you can make money because people, the British were making money with that, but you didn't, never got involved in, in, into that. The, we need to be uh, uh, completely direct about this. Indian people are into tea, most. 
than coffee, but you need to change that. You need to, if you are a producer, if we are a, you need to embrace your coffee and you need to assimilate that as your own coach. There is no, it's, it's, it's mandatory, this is not optional if you want to be successful. Uh, for example, I, I, I don't know how many, how many coffee farmers do we have here? Can you? Mm, interesting. And how many of you do Robusta? Some of you do Robusta and Arabica as well. That's very interesting. I'm sorry, because I don't, I, I don't know many of you. I would love to, to have more time to, to talk. Uh, so for, for example, recently I, I had the opportunity to visit a, 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 tea, a tea farm. And it was beautiful, the, the view, all, all the equipment. It was so well managed, it was, everything was so beautiful. And at, by the end of the, the tour, they gave me the, one of the best teas that I have ever had. And I would love, I don't, I don't know is the case, but I, will, I, will, I don't know that people that produce coffee would do the same. I know that local people, local producers, are able to identify really, really nice teas, because I, I witness it. But I don't know if local people are, will, are able to realize when they have a good, good product, coffee product. If you don't know your product, that's the part that we, we're going to, let's, let's talk about that later. Let's talk about uh, differentiation. The, there is a slide for, 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 for about that. So the, 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 the few conversations that I have had with, with some of you is most of you, they say, look, uh, I'm receiving prices or the offers that I get are for commodity. You know, I, and commodity doesn't pay the bills. My cost of productions are higher most of the time. Now the pandemic has given us a break. Now the price is very, is very high. There, there was a disruption in the supply chain. And so that increases the price even more. And then Brazil had issues with the crop, and that increases the prices even more. But that lock is not going to last forever. The, the prices are going, to, are going to get stable, and the, the, the price, if you see in history, it has been steadily low. The only way that it could change is that if we bet that something, is going to, some, something horrible is going to happen to the coffee industry in Brazil, and the, the price will immediately go up. But that's, that's a a big assumption and a big bet probably would never happen. So what is your, 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 your duty right now as coffee producer? You need to think about the future. You need to use this, this, this break that you have right now that the market is paying a little more in order to change, to evolve. I'm, I, I don't like the, the, the word revolution because I think revolutions are dumb. Usually, people that go into revolution, they do it with their gut. They don't do it with their minds. So what I, what I think is that you need to think about evolution. You need to think about taking what you have and get the best of it. You don't need to erase, like many countries did with, with the British legacy. They erase it, like telling everyone, this is bad. This is not what we want. But they did something. Some of the things were bad, but some of the things were good. So let's keep the good. And let's, our, our feelings and our, our, our guts, just keep it there and use our minds and use what we have. And you still have that legacy. You still have what they, they left. And you, you, you have coffee that it, it potentially be worth a lot. Places like Kenya that had a very similar issues like you, they receive the, the coffee plantation from the, from the colony and they didn't know what to do with it. And now, in the last 10 years, they have lost 30% of the, of the plantations that they were around Nairobi. So this is something that, that you, if you want to keep, keep, keep the, 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 the coffee industry alive, you cannot afford to do that. You need to think about local market. You need to think about exports. You need to think about quality. You need to think about all the, all the things that I'm going to introduce you to that is a lot because, it, well, we will get to that point. So in terms of differentiation, you don't have many options. You can keep doing what you're doing. That is just selling commodity and completely ignore the quality and just trying to sell and survive with the, with the commodity price because right now are good and hoping for the best. But the other, the other uh, options 
uh, are to, or certify them or to go for higher, higher quality. In, in the fungible industry, that it will be the commodity the market, only volume has value. Whoever has the most volume, it will have the lower cost of production. And if you have the lower cost of production, you will have more, the, the highest potential of making profit. That's how it works. Vietnam, they started in uh, the early 80s with a very little production of, of, um, of uh, uh, Robusta, and now they're the second largest producers in the world. They produce 70% of all the coffee in the world. And they're making profits, but completely betting on volume. They don't care about quality, they just volume, volume, volume. And they have huge issues in terms of uh, biodiversity, water management. It's not sustainable. Eventually, that is going to explode on their faces. The same in Brazil, not in all areas, but in some places in Brazil, it will happen too. So, in, 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 so if we want to be more sustainable, if we want to think more about the future, we need to move away. It's not just money. Also, the future, we're, we're, we're really dealing with climate change, we're dealing with trash, we're dealing with so many things. So we, we cannot add coffee production as part of the problem. We need to keep it away from the, from the, from the, the problem. And uh, industrial farming, that it has been a, a, a push into coffee, in, in Brazil and in other parts of Latin America, that's also something that needs to pass, it needs to change. So I don't, for many, many, many reasons, I wouldn't try to, to stay on what you're doing on, on the commodity grade. So how do you do the differentiate? The second option will be certified coffees. Certified coffees, I, I have worked with several farmers that, that have them, or they, they are working and get them. And uh, they do a lot in terms of being professional. Many farmers, you receive these farms, and it's not just you, so don't feel bad about it. It's just, it's everyone. You got this farm, you inherited from your father or whatever, and you never thought how to deal with it. How can I be a professional coffee farmer? You don't know, and no one knows. So certification allows you, when you follow it, when you pass, all the requirements, it gives you an idea of how to professionally run a farm. It tells you how professionally have fertilizers around, how to store them, how to keep uh, uh, chemicals, how to deal with people. In, co in cooperatives, they, they give you the, the, the um, steps of how to run a democratic uh, direction so you don't stay in, in power forever. Or also it, it tells you to be transparent or shows you how to be transparent in your accountability and your accountant and your accounting. Uh, so it's very, it's very helpful in that sense. But if, if you acquire your certification, if you apply for certification to get money, forget about it. If you apply to learn and to become more professional, it's good. But if you get it because you want to get more money or even a higher part of the market, a higher a, a stake in the market, that's not going to happen. The problem with the certification is this was developed by the consuming side. I always told farmers, look, consumers, buyers, they're not your friends. They're, yours, they're, your, they're your clients, but they're not your friends. Your, their interest is completely opposite to your interest. So when they make money, you're losing it. It's basically as simple as that. So when, when certification agencies, they release the certification programs, they release it in such a way for coffee shops and retailers and roasters to get more money. It's basically it. When you see, I put that, that picture just for you to have an example, but I'm sure you have seen it. If you see that coffee, is certified, is USA organic, and is fair trade. We know Green Mountain coffee, but this coffee, to, in order to get USA certified, and in order to get fair trade certified, this coffee needs to be fully traceable. That means that the identity of the producer that actually conceived that coffee is known. But the roaster, 
is deciding not to show it to you. So at the end, if you're not a, a trained person or a, not a knowledgeable play, play person, like many consumers are, you're gonna see, you're gonna see that coffee trees and I say, wow, Green Mountain is organic. And it's not. There are no organic certified coffees. There are only organic certified producers. But this is a, a, a terminology that the, 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 consume, the, the consuming side uses in order to use your certification for them to sell more coffee. That coffee, those seals are giving the roaster more money. They're selling that coffee at least one or two dollars more they're getting for that bag of coffee. And the producer is getting nothing, not even the credit of being on the label. This bag of coffee, or a bag of coffee, is a, is a summary, or is the, is the simplification, or is the, the, the concentration of the work of sometimes thousands of people. And when a certification is released, the name of those people are known. They are known, the certification agency, they know it, but they are deciding not to show it to you. So there is no full transparency. And when there is no full transparency, we know as, as coffee producers, we know that the main problem in the, in the industry is transparency, the lack of transparency. And these people are deciding not to be transparent even though they have full trustability. So that's why I don't, you can use certification for your own good, but don't think that certification is gonna, they need certification to help you. Ah, they wanna, ah, they wanna help farmers around the world like Fairtrade. Fairtrade is a name that it sounds like it's trying to help farmers and trying to help poor people around the world, but it's not. They're only trying to help roasters. Roasters, that's it. And retailers. So the, the, the certifications, those are the pros and cons of, of certifies. And then we go to producing high quality coffees. This is also not free of problems. I'm gonna explain it now. And, uh, but, what I like, and that's why I'm fully into this, and I have been working on this for 12 years of my life, and sometimes working seven days a week. I did that for many years. Uh, it's because I believe that when you have power in your hands, quality belongs to you. If the coffee is bad or good or whatever, it's your responsibility. And it's something that you can manage, you can do it, you can deal with it while certification or buyers of your commodity or whatever, that doesn't, it's not in your hands, it's not your responsibility. So if you are able to produce a high quality coffee, it's just a matter of time that someone is gonna show up and buy it to you. The only thing that you need to focus on is on excellence, to be the best version of your product, pro, uh, of producing self as a coffee farmer. And uh, if you achieve it, you know, just put it into the world, and the world will, will, will accept it. It will take time, it's not gonna be easy, but sooner or later, it will happen. But what is the problem? I'm gonna tell you what happened with the, with the producers that I help in faster, okay? Myanmar. In Myanmar, these farmers, we, very short, we move it from, they were producing a, a, a commodity coffee, and we move them into specialty. They were selling to Europe, they were selling amazing coffee, and they grew. We started with five communities and then they moved to 25 communities and now there are 30 communities. They started with two containers and they, they moved to 10 containers and now they're around 15 containers. The problem is that now they don't have buyers. When you sell commodity, you sell in, 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 in container loads. But a specialty coffee is I people talk about I micro lots. I buy 10, 10 bags here, 20 bags here. So you say, well, that's not gonna pay the bills. I need to sell 150 containers. And this guy only wants 10 bags. And you need to deal with these people. And this is, this is a problem that you need to learn how to manage. So also there is an a, a overhead that you're gonna have because you need to consolidate containers that you didn't need to do before. Like, I oh, these people, I oh, this one, they want uh, these lots mixed with the lots of the neighbor and mixed with the lots of, so they, they, it, 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 it gives you headaches. It's not gonna be easy, it's, it's hard. 
Also, the, the quality needs to be very well copped, very well assessed before you ship everything to overseas. So you have headaches. You have a lot to learn. But I'm telling you, it is worth it. And it's possible, and it can be done. So the, the, this is what we were talking about. The, there are two rules in marketing, only very basic rules. The first one is know your product. How can you, as a coffee, as a coffee farmer, like you need to be honest with yourself, how can you know the price of your coffee if you don't know how your coffee tastes like? How do you know uh, how to reach your customer if you don't know what type of customer you need? And the, everything is going to be told to you by your coffee. When you cup it, you say, ah, well, I have a coffee that is like an 85, and it has a, this profile, and it's very good for espresso, so I'm going to aim for this type of companies in Europe, here and there. So it, only by tasting your own coffee, it gives you the orientation. It's your compass in terms of the market. For example, when we were working in Myanmar, we cupped the coffees, and we knew what type of coffee we had. And in or, in, based on that, we started targeting customers. And this is the same type of work we, you, should, you should do eventually. So what do you need to know? You need to know about visual assessment of making your, seeing your beans and being able to detect the defects before they show up to somebody else. One defect is ruin. One defect is fine for a commodity. Even 17 defects is well good for commodity. But in specialty, no defects. So you need to improve the way you work. Also, the sensory evaluation. If you don't want to get into that, there's a lot to study. There is a lot to, to become a certified Q grader or whatever. And it takes a long time, several tries. You need to, with this, you need to get obsessed. And, and, and the, only one, the only way to survive sometimes is to get obsessed, because it's the only way that you're going to be able to, to withstand all the, the things that you need to do in order to, to get to this. Um, so, Know your product is very, very important. And knowing your product is what is going to tell you about your customer. If you know your customer and if you know your product, you're going to be able to have a very, very nice relationship with your buyer. And I have seen that many times with many buyers. The problem is when the buyers are quiet. When the buyers are quiet, that means that they believe that you don't know enough. They know that they cannot share information with you because you, you, you are not going to understand it. But if you know enough and you talk the same language that they do, they're going to be open and they're going to give you feedback. They're going to give you feedback about what they didn't like, what they like, or what they want to have. But everything is in terms of your level of professionalism. The, the customer experience is another thing that you cannot forget. I lived in Ethiopia for many years, and, and the Ethiopians, they had amazing coffees. But they, didn't, they were not replying emails. They were, they, 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 the buyers were calling, and somebody would answer the phone in Amharic, and these people, they wouldn't know what to do. And the, 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 the containers would stop in Djibouti for months, and, and the, the buyers would, they, they didn't know what happened. So keeping that relationship, that dialogue open, is also very, very important. It's not just about quality in the cup and quality in the coffee. It's about the quality as you as a human being interact. Inter it's not that these guys are going to become your, your, your partners or your, or your friends, but they need to, you, you have to have a partnership with them in order to be successful. That's know your customer. So what, with what you have, what can you do? That's why I, I created this. Uh, this uh, because now you're telling, oh, look, I need to learn so many things. I don't know. What, what can I do? Well, you are in India. India is a country that receives the first coffee varieties in the world, the first commercial varieties that were introduced in the world got here first. And many people, many researchers, they, they are working on them even today. And you can get beautiful varietals. You can get Bourbon. I used to have one uh, varietal in Myanmar that was produced here in, in India that is S795. Probably some of you are familiar with it. And it's a, it's a, a, a um, Hybrid between Kent and um, and and what? Uh huh. Well, the thing is that it's, it's great. It's, it's very resistant to disease, and the quality in the cup is amazing. 
and that helped in our success in, in, in Myanmar. So these varieties were developed by Indian people and they are there. So if you, if you look, I, I have customers when we were in Tanzania, we were growing some coffees that were not that great. Some varietals that I tried and I said, oh, this is not that great. But farmers or producers are so interested in trying new things that they will buy only to try new things. And it will in, in, increase your offering. Because in the past, before 1989, farmers will have only one coffee. But nowadays, with processing and with varietals and, and value added, you can have Zero. competitive. So the new is this one, innovative processing is the other one, that is the one that we're going to talk of after this presentation, uh, that is just creating anaerobic uh, wash coffees, uh, uh, naturals, or uh, all of that. And, uh, and value added, that it could be, even if you start roasting and betting on local market, that I've seen that happens. I've seen that, for example, in Guatemala or, or uh, Honduras, local people are willing to pay more than uh, exporting the coffee. That helps a lot because you don't need to, to get into the trouble of exporting, only by selling locally. The, the local market is very important and it's very important to invest in uh, uh, teaching people, regular people, about good coffees, about good practices, even barista competitions, espresso, and all these things that are so popular. Uh, well, I'm going to start in processing, but if we need to stop, I can, I can leave that for later. Is that possible? Can I continue? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'm, yeah, because I, I, yeah, this is, I'm going to start in terms of processing right now. That, Every time I, I go into production and to processing facilities, I realize that uh, the main problem is uh, defects and mainly fermentation. Fermentation is, through history, has always been a problem and it has always been a, 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 an enemy for the producer. We always wanted to erase fermentation. I remember to have uh, had some uh, conversations with with all producers and they tell me, no, in order to have a good coffee, your parchment after wash needs to be completely clean, very, very white. And uh, yeah, in your time that worked. But nowadays, if your parchment is completely white, you're losing something. Probably that coffee would have had a nice fermentation that will give it, will boost its flavor. Because in his time, fermentation was always bad. But in my time, I can have accidental fermentation or intentional fermentation. The, the best is to keep fermentation on your side. Always use what it gives you and to completely remove that act, what can take from you. So in naturals, that is very common. People say, ah, naturals taste really bad. Oh, naturals are so horrible. And it's because they don't know about fermentation. This coffee ferments for a month in, on top of a table, doesn't dry well, and it's gonna taste bad. But if you know what you're doing, if you know about processing, that shouldn't happen. And you can have the most beautiful natural coffees in the world. So mainly my work when I go to farms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't really do this, but so more than, than expected. But I have another a period uh, in the afternoon. Well after after the break. Exactly. Five minutes. No? Ah, okay. So what do you want to finish now? Okay, let, um, okay, okay. Now I understand. So after lunch, we're going to continue. Uh, so I'm going to finalize, finalize the idea. But if you can see what is coming now, it's very interesting. We're going to talk about naturals, about wash, about all these very, very important things that, that actually was the, the main topic of the of the of the uh, the lecture. So uh, this is the history of wet processing and, and fermentation, the mechanical, and all of that. So we're going to touch that all about uh, uh, about processing after lunch. So uh, well, you can we can leave it. 
till now, and, and after we come back, we continue. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Masolo, for your uh, thoughts and for your perspectives. Uh, we look forward to hearing more from you on uh, the various kinds of fermentation and how to improve our quality and make it fit for the specialty market uh, when we come back, when we resume in the afternoon. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, kindly accept these mementos from Upasi.